Well, hey, everyone. I am so glad that you're joining us today. Thanks to those of you who are watching online. I'm glad you're joining us as well. We are in week two of a series that we are calling Mantras. And the idea behind this series is pretty simple. A mantra is a repeatable short phrase that we've taken directly from Scripture that reminds us of the type of people that you and I are called to be. Listen, we understand this mission that we've been put on, this journey of walking with Jesus, it's not easy. We understand there are times when we get distracted, there are times when we get discouraged, and we need places to go that remind us of who we've been called to be and the urgency of the mission that Jesus has given us. Hence, the mantras are born. And so last week, we opened up with our first mantra. Uh, This was taken directly from Scripture and is really the linchpin for everything else that we're going to talk about over these next five weeks. It's a reminder of what is the most important thing. As you and I seek to be a type of people, a type of church that, that Christ is building and refining, we need to remember that there is one shepherd that we follow. There is one path that we take. There is one person that we cling to as we strive to be the type of church that Jesus has called us to be. And so our first mantra last week, many of you remember, was follow the way. Everything hinges upon us recognizing that life is only found through Jesus. Here's why this matters in our culture. We live in a culture that says that truth is both everywhere and nowhere at the same time. That all roads, as it pertains to religions, all roads lead to God or lead to the afterlife if they're followed sincerely. And yet Jesus seems to dismantle this. He says there is one way. There's one way to bridge the gap between a holy, righteous father and sinful humanity. And that way is through me. You and I are called to follow Christ, to trust in him, to believe and obey what he has said to do. And so we start with this first mantra of reminding ourselves we follow the way. As we look here in week two, uh, we've got a new mantra to, to bring forth as to the type of people that we're called to be, the type of church that we want to see Redbrush be. And, and a big part of that is aligning with the direction that God would have us go, uh, aligning with the power of his Holy Spirit and catching the wind, so to speak, to take us wherever he would have us go and do the things that he would have us do for his glory. And so in week two, we're laying out this mantra, raise the sails. Uh, We're going to open up our Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 1. And we're going to look at the beginning of Acts. As Luke is writing this book, he's giving you kind of a synopsis of everything that's happened over the last few days. And and so here's how he opens up Acts chapter 1. He says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set By his own authority. You think about all of the things that the disciples have have seen and and witnessed and heard over the last few days. Jesus has been publicly executed at the hands of the Roman Empire, and no doubt there's this feeling of is he who he says he is? Did he actually accomplish what he said he was going to accomplish? Have, Have we been duped for just another false Messiah in a long list of them? And yet, they, they spend these better part of three days as Jesus is crucified and he's buried in a tomb. They sit waiting and, and wondering what to make of their faith in Jesus. Uh, imagine the, the bittersweet moment of extreme joy and, and yet this underlying despair as they, they see Jesus fully alive. And yet, they hear this reminder that he's going away soon. These are real people with real feelings, 
real thoughts, real doubts, real fears. And all of these are being played upon over the course of these 40 days. And yet Jesus gives them this promise that is meant to be hopeful, that is meant to fill them with power. He says, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. What is he doing here in this moment? Although they don't recognize it fully, what he's doing here is he's reminding them of the absolute necessity of the Spirit in the believer's life. You and I as a church, here's what we need to understand. We don't operate apart from the Spirit. In fact, Scripture is clear over and over and over again. There are things that a believer simply cannot do apart from the Spirit. And the first thing is this. Romans uh, chapter 8 verse 9 tells us you're not even a believer apart from the Spirit. There is no such thing as a Christian that is not filled with the Holy Spirit. Those things go together. And, And Paul writes in Romans 8, one doesn't happen without the other. We see throughout Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you can't be united to Jesus without the Spirit. You can't be adopted as God's children without the Spirit. Romans 8, 14 reminds us. You can't even be truly a part of the body of Christ, meaning the global church. You're not a part of that apart from the Spirit. And so over and over again, the the Scriptures remind us that there's this absolute necessity for the believer of you being empowered and filled by the Holy Spirit. Here's the problem. In the Christian church world, of which we're a part of, there's often this tendency to completely ignore the Holy Spirit. And and, and I get it. We don't understand it. And honestly, the the examples that we've seen uh, on on TV or through some fruity televangelists, like we've seen these things that are like, I don't know that I want a part of that. And yet, as we look at Scripture, we see that's not what it is. It's, It's not, he's not hokey. He's not this mystical being. He is God Almighty. And so we've got to stop viewing the Holy Spirit as some offshoot. We've got to stop looking at the Holy Spirit as some additional add-on to the life of the believer. It is an absolute necessity for you and I. It is an absolute necessity for us as a church to be empowered by the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We do not move without the Spirit. And yet, what Jesus has told his disciples is that this is an absolute necessity, and they're still confused about why why the Holy Spirit's coming. Their concern is really about Israel and, and the kingdom of Israel itself, and so they ask this innocent enough question. They say, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now listen, here's here's what they're actually asking. Lord, is the coming of the Spirit an indication that you are about to destroy the Romans? Are you about to get revenge? And this is what they're waiting on. And Jesus says, no, no. The Spirit has come for a much bigger purpose than just that. He says in verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. For what purpose, you may ask? Well, Jesus addresses this. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But what you're seeing is Jesus reminding them and proclaiming to them there are going to be expanding ripples of the gospel. Here's what you may not notice as you look at this. Oftentimes we look at our Bibles, you you may not understand some of the context behind this. Uh, For Jesus to say that the gospel is going to go forth from Jerusalem, first of all, they would be like, we're great with that. These are our people. But then he says, and it's going to continue to Judea and Samaria. Jesus, you're, you're you're going to save those half-breed Samaritans? Those who are not fully Jews, you're, you're coming for them? And he takes it even further. He says, and we're, we're going to take this to the ends of the earth. And Jesus, I thought, I thought you were just for the Jews. I thought the gospel message was just for us and and Israel. And this is about expanding the territory and and proclaiming the kingdom of Israel. And Jesus says, no, it's it's much bigger than that. This is about the salvation of all who will call on my name. This is an uncomfortable moment in the life of the disciples. Because they've, they've underestimated the reach of the gospel. 
They've certainly underestimated their part in expanding the reach of the gospel when Jesus reminds them, you're going to take this message to the ends of the earth. And he reminds them, he says, I'm going to be with you through the power of my spirit. And because of the power of that spirit, you're going to be able to accomplish this. Or or maybe a better way to say it is, I'm going to be able to accomplish this through you. We do not move without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the disciples obey. They wait in Jerusalem. They, they are, are longing for this promise that Jesus has given them, but they're waiting, wondering when's it going to come. We move to Acts chapter 2, and we see on the day of Pentecost that promise is fulfilled. Here's how it reads, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What what are you seeing in this moment? Not some crazy hokey thing. You're seeing the gospel go forth. What's the message that the disciples are enabled to speak in other languages? They're enabled to speak the gospel. That on the day of Pentecost, when all of these people from all around the world, all different tongues, all different nations, all different tribes are there in Jerusalem, the disciples are able to communicate or they're able to hear in their native language the truth of who Jesus is and why he's come. The good news of the resurrection, the good news of the crucifixion for sinful men and women. This is the moment you're seeing that the Spirit moves as it pleases, it works as it pleases to accomplish the will of God. In fact, John addresses this in in his gospel, that there is this kind of wild nature to the person of the Holy Spirit. Not not just crazy, not not mysticism type stuff, but but he's reminding us, listen, the the second you try to pin down what you believe the Holy Spirit is going to do, what he can and can't do, uh, you're going to see you, you, you don't know. In fact, John writes this in John 3, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. And so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So what is the response of the church to the person of the Holy Spirit who goes where he wants to accomplish the will of the Father? If the Holy Spirit is the wind then you and I as a church are simply called to raise the sails. We are simply called to allow the Holy Spirit to work in and amongst us and through us to accomplish the will of God, to glorify Him and to make disciples that know and live in obedience to Christ. You know, as I I think about this analogy of the sailboat, I'm reminded that a, a sailboat operates with a full dependence on the wind. In fact, you don't see a sailboat operating in days where it's not windy. It's it's fully dependent on the power of the wind. In fact, a sailboat exists for this specific purpose. To reach a destination as empowered by the wind. This is what it's made for. And so as we look at this analogy and we transfer it to us as the church, we recognize this is what we were made for. To, To operate as a sailboat, to reach people with the gospel message as directed by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is who we're called to be. And you, know, you think about this idea of, of a boat. I think about a dock. As you see these, these boats just kind of sitting there, no one walks on a dock and, and sees boats tied up and says, now that, that's what a boat's made for. No one who, who either has a boat or, or wants a boat sees a boat that is tied up, that is anchored, that is just gently bobbing with the, the, the calm waves and says, that's it. That's what I want. No. No, they, they, they want to feel the wind. They want to feel the power. They want to be a part of that. They don't want to sit on the, the dock. They don't want to sit anchored and not going anywhere. The boat is meant to go and reach a destination. John Shedd has this famous quote. He says, a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships were built for. Listen, as a church, um, man, 
And this, this is something that is often difficult for us because if we're not careful, we can be content to be on the ship but to stay in the harbor. We can be content to just do things the way that we've always done them. We can be content to just hold on to our traditions. Not that traditions in and of themselves are bad, but when they become the thing that we worship, we've got a problem. They, they can be something to where we say, hey, we're going we're gonna to look good on the outside. Like We're going to get on the ship, but we're not actually going to go anywhere. We're going to clean ourselves up, and we're going to come here for an hour on Sunday morning. We're going to be present, but we're not actually going to do anything with the gospel message. We're not going to leave this place and go make disciples. We're not going to reach the hard to reach. We're not going to go and love the unlovable. We can be a ship that is stuck in the harbor. That may look good, but actually serves no specific function. A.W. Tozer had this kind of chilling quote where he talks about the church operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says this, he says, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would notice the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. And so the question is this, what are you and I holding on to that is preventing us from being led by the power of the Holy Spirit? For many of us, it's, it's just comfort or it's fear. It's the unknown. And, and I think one of the things that, that happens is we, we, we start to count the cost and we think of all the things that, that the gospel could cause us to lose. Well, what if it costs me my job? What if it costs me friendships? What if it costs me social standing? What if it costs me financial gain? What if it costs me my very life? And, and let me encourage you with this. None of those are off the table. In fact, listen to what Jesus has told his disciples and, and realize that this is the same call that he's given to you and I. He says, who, Jesus says to his disciples, Matthew 16, verse 24, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. But whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. You should begin to realize that in the kingdom, the things that often seem to matter here on earth aren't actually the things that matter in eternity. That... That the things that, that this world tells us hold tight to, cling to, acquire as much as you can, the kingdom says, hey, you need to risk that all and lose it all for the sake of the gospel because this is what actually matters. I don't want to be a ship that is stuck in the harbor. I, I don't want to be a believer who can say all the right things on Sunday morning. I, I don't want to be the leader of a church that looks good maybe to the, uh, the outside world, but yet doesn't actually go and and preach the gospel when we leave this place. I don't want to be a church that just tries to acquire more people and doesn't equip them to actually go, doesn't send people out to see the gospel expand. One of the things I've noticed in my life is that um, as time goes on, things change. You, You realize things that you thought were important in your younger days aren't actually important at all. Uh, You realize the things that you put tremendous value in actually didn't have as much value as you thought they did. And so as you get older, things change. And and I think about younger me and the things that I really held dear. One of the things that I valued more than anything was approval. I I wanted to be liked. In fact, I, I would say and do things that would not really be in my nature, what I knew to be right, but if I thought it was what you wanted to see or hear, um, I, I would adapt to that. I would, I would say I'd had opinions that I didn't actually have. I would say I had uh, values that I didn't actually have because I thought that aligned with maybe what somebody else wanted to hear. Now, in, as I'm, I'm growing and hopefully maturing, I, I realize... Being liked isn't all it's cracked up to be. I don't set out to be disliked. But I'd rather be respected than liked. I want to be a man who is known for standing for the right things. I want to be a man who, 
even if he walks alone, is, is willing to stand for the truth. I want to be a man who lives by convictions and, and values and holds to those. I want to be a man who is disciplined in the things that actually matter. And, and if that costs me likes and popularity, so be it. Younger me used to, to really cling to safety. I, I could pretend with the best of them, but I would always keep myself insulated in a bubble that I knew wasn't going to be too uncomfortable. Now as I get older, I, I want impact. I want to make a difference for the things that actually matter. I, I want to make a difference for the kingdom. I want to be a person who, who isn't afraid to preach the gospel message, not just here on a Sunday morning, but, but out there. I want impact. The younger me was always for the here and now. How's this going to satisfy my desire now? How's this going to scratch that itch now? And now as I've hopefully grown and matured in the Lord, I, I want to be about the things that are going to last much past me in this life. And I want to, I want to invest in the things that are going to matter in eternity. I want to be like a man named Adoniram Judson. Adoniram Judson um, was a missionary uh, to the southern part of India. And uh, he wrote a letter to his prospective father-in-law. He was dating a young woman and, and wanted to, to ask for her hand in marriage. And so he asked the father through a letter. It's one of the most haunting letters I've ever read. Um, one of the most prophetic letters I've ever read, knowing the story and how it plays out. Uh, you talk about a, an eternal mindset. Adoniram had that, and apparently so did his future wife's father. Here's the letter, or a snippet of what Adoniram wrote. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world whether you can consent to her departure and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life, whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you? For the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God, can you consent to all of this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened with the acclamations of praise which shall resound to her Savior from heathen saved through her means from eternal woe and despair. <laughs> As a believer, I love that letter. As a dad of two young daughters, I absolutely hate it. <laughs> But there's a freedom in that that I want. There's a boldness, there's a courage that I desire. One that says it may cost me everything in this life, but I will gain it all back in the next. Uh, there's a freedom that says whatever the ramifications are now, The negatives will be forgotten in eternity. Only the positives will remain. Only the souls that have been saved by the work of the gospel going forth, only that's going to matter. There is freedom in the Spirit. There is adventure in the Spirit. There is unknown in the Spirit, but there is certainty in the Spirit. There is unknown as to the cost. There is unknown as to the destination. There is uh, unknown as to all of the details, but there is certainty in the one who understands it all. There is certainty in the one who has it all mapped out. There is certainty in the one who could be trusted in his God Almighty. And he's given us his spirit to guide us. And, and so the question is, is will you raise the sails in your own lives? Will we raise the sails as a church to be a part of what he's doing and what he wants to do in, in, in Louisville and in Florida and Clay County and beyond? Will we catch the wind? Will we raise the sails to be a part of what he is calling us 
to do. I want to end with this story. I've, I've told different parts of it before. Uh, about two and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to travel to Greece. And, and I've explained all this before, but I had the opportunity to go to uh, different uh, ruin sites, uh, different old pagan temples, um, different uh, really important places in Christian history. I um, see all of those things, and man, they were awesome. And, but it feels sacrilegious to say that none of those were my favorite part of the trip. Uh, my favorite part of the trip happened in a city called Corinth. Uh, maybe you've heard of that before if you've read First and Second Corinthians. Um, this is where Paul is writing to. But I wasn't at the, the ruins. I wasn't at the, the old spot where the believers gathered. Um, I was over a bridge in Corinth uh, as cars were whizzing by. And, and I happened to, we happened to be walking on this bridge on the side. And I saw this yellow logo that looked familiar to me. If you've heard me talk about this before, one of the, the shows that, that I love and my family loves to watch at home is The Amazing Race. Like one of my dreams is to be on that show and... and like, I'm trying, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but I, I see the Amazing Race logo on this kind of, this poster. It's by this building, and so I'm intrigued by it. And so we walk over to this building, we realize quickly what it is. It's, it's a bungee jumping facility. And this was the spot where the, one of the seasons, the contestants had to go, and, and they had to bungee jump over the Corinth Canal. And the Corinth Canal is one that... Uh, that connects two bodies of water. And you see all these ships come through uh, connecting the, the trade route here. And I knew in that moment, like, a decision had to be made. Am I going to do it or am I going to walk away from this? And I'm, I'm with five or six other guys and I'm, I'm never going to live this down. And I'm also thinking, on the other hand, like, when I, when I tell my wife, um, what she's going to say first is, I'm glad you're okay but what's going to quickly follow that is also you're an idiot. So I knew what was coming. I'm like trying to weigh which, which one matters more to me in this moment. And, and I realized like I got to spend the next few days still in Greece with these guys. So I'm not going to let them think any less of me as a man. I, I'm going to do it. And so we walk into the facility. We get strapped up and you watch this informational video and you see how everything's going to go. And, and so I asked the owner jokingly kind of, I said, hey, um, has anybody ever died at your facility. He's like, no, not today. Straps me in. He's like, gets me out the door. And so uh, all these emotions and thoughts are running through my mind. Like, why, why am I doing this? This is ridiculous. I got four little kids at home. I got a wife. I got a church. What, what am I doing? And, and so, but again, my pride gets the best of me. And I slowly walk across this bridge that is underneath the bridge where all these cars are going by. And, and there's this bungee jumping platform. And I, I get up to the platform and get to the edge and I, I just happened to look down and gosh it seemed a lot higher than when I was safely over there by the building I'm starting to think like maybe this isn't the best idea yes I've paid money for it but maybe I can get partial refund it's safer it's safer to go back to where I was now I feel the 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 cord that's getting tighter on my legs I feel the tension I'm like I don't know if this is a good idea I'm looking down I'm thinking about all the things that can go wrong like, what if, what if I die? One, pretty cool story, and what a way to go out. But, but two, like, I'm leaving behind a family. Like, I've got responsibilities, and is this a smart idea? Think about everything that can go wrong in there. This is my favorite part of the trip. I think the guy that uh, was, was hooking me up and was making sure everything was set to go uh, kind of sensed that I was having some doubts. He sees me looking down and, and seeing the, uh, the, the water, seeing the rocks right next to it and thinking about all the things that could happen to me. And he, he gives me this statement that I will never forget. He says, in broken English, he says, look up, man, you're alive. In that moment, I look and I, I see the horizon. I see the, the beauty and I, I kind of sense the adventure in front of me. And, and so... You know, he counts down, and, and I'm like, this is it. Like, we're, we're either going to jump or we're going to back out. And he gets there, and I'm like, I'm a man. I, I've, I've, I'm prideful. I can't ever live this down if I don't. And I jump. And it was one of those moments where after I jumped, I realized this is one of the greatest things I've ever done, and I want to do it again. Like, it, it's just one of those things. Like, it was dumb. It was stupid. Can't believe I did it. When's the next one? And I realize that over the course of the times that I've shared the gospel in my life, this is the feeling you get. Like, this, this is what I've been called 
to do. This is who I've been called to be. I'm called to be a disciple of Jesus who in turn makes disciples. I'm, I'm called to point them to Christ. And, and so for us, I, I think the Spirit would tell us, like, look up. You're alive. This is life. This is freedom. This is the mission at hand. And, and you will find that it is fulfilling when you actually participate. And so as a church, from now and until Christ comes back, we want to be a people who daily die to ourselves, raise the sails, and catch the wind of the Holy Spirit. There is freedom, there is life found in this unknown but certain journey. Father, would you, would you make us these people? Lord, as we seek to be more and more empowered by your Spirit, we, we simply ask that you would help us realize it's going to take less and less of us and more and more of you. So, Father, would you help each one of us surrender that as we seek to raise the sails in our life and, and as a church, Father, that we would recognize it's going to take dying to ourselves. It's going to take getting over our pride, our fears, and that you're on the other side of those. Father, there is life on the other side of, of raising the sails and, and being empowered by your spirit. There is life in getting over our, our fears and our, our selfishness. Lord, we want that. And so we ask that, that you would make us those people, that your spirit would sanctify us, that you would change us, that you would convict us and cause us to repent. And Lord, that we would, we would look more like you and that we would have the marks of a life that is lived on mission. Father, we thank you that all of this is laid before us because of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. Father, we know that the gospel message is where salvation is found. You've told us that, that you are the way and the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through you. I pray that we would grow in a greater sense of understanding of that, that we would walk in obedience because we believe that is true that we would submit our lives to the power of the Spirit because we believe there is life found in you. And so, Father, we ask all of this in the name of the one who died for us and is seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting to return in power forever. It's in his name that we pray.